The following program deals with controversial subjects. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight on Sightings, do deadly apparitions haunt Alcatraz prison? There are at least a hundred ghosts here. Our investigative team led by a paranormal expert comes face to face with a frightening entity. Then, since 1991, thousands of Mexican citizens have witnessed UFOs and captured them on videotape. What could it mean? Find out tonight. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. We begin a new series of investigations tonight with a trip to Alcatraz. Since the world's most infamous prison was open to the public in 1973, some visitors claim to have felt the ghostly presence of long-dead inmates. Well, Park Service officials won't comment. So, along with the Sightings investigative team, I went to Alcatraz. There's a strange pull you feel viewing this imposing outpost from shore. It was once the toughest prison in America home to Al Capone, Machine Gun Kelly, and the Birdman of Alcatraz. It started in the 1850s as a military fortress defending San Francisco Bay. We're in the guardhouse built in 1857. It was intended to be used as a defensive point. There was a gun that would have been mounted here, but it got, never got used. Instead, this was turned into the first cell block on Alcatraz in 1863. Insubordinate soldiers were locked away in tiny cells, measuring only three by six feet. They were beaten, chained to the walls, and forced to endure hard labor on the rock. Alcatraz boomed, and by 1909, the cell house that dominates the top of the island had been built for the incarceration of military prisoners. Alcatraz remained a barbaric military prison until the 1930s, when social upheaval reached a peak and mobsters ruled the big city streets. The Justice Department requested that the military surrender the island, and Alcatraz was transformed into a maximum security prison, the last stop for America's most hardened criminals. The monsters of society were stored here until 1963, when the prison closed. Alcatraz was open to the public in 1973, and attracts 4,000 tourists a day. There are reports that Alcatraz is haunted. Could the pain and suffering endured by prisoners at Alcatraz still exist today in the form of ghosts? When you walk in, it's really dark and it's very cold in there and I got the chills and I had to leave. I didn't like it at all. Normally I don't <laughs> believe in ghosts, but in a place like that where there have been so many violent deaths and the kind of people that were there, you know, it's, it's quite possible. I think uh, it, it's a natural idea that when you come onto the island, you're going to be experiencing something a little, a little special, you know, a little extra. Sounds of a cell door closing, uh, somebody appearing and then disappearing. Uh, those type of things would uh, uh, really send chills up your spine. Ray Polo, a former Park Service ranger on the island, claims many ghostly encounters have occurred. But for the past 19 years, the Park Service has refused to talk about reports that Alcatraz is haunted. Official policy about ghosts on Alcatraz is uh, we would say that, in, in effect, well, maybe things had happened, maybe they didn't. It's just something that uh, it wasn't uh, officially sanctioned. Are there ghosts on Alcatraz? We asked nationally renowned psychic investigator Peter James to spend a night on the rock. I walked with Peter as he tried to communicate with what he calls entities inside Alcatraz. As we walked through the cell blocks, Peter began to hear what he felt were the voices of tortured spirits. Alcatraz was a place that drove men mad. Military prison. They're in pain, and I'm in pain, and there's blood here. They couldn't break out of the prison. Like a psychic bloodhound, Peter was drawn to out-of-the-way places around the island. I know little or nothing about Alcatraz other than what I learned here during the past two days that I've been here. And my 
my feelings are strongly that there is an energy here unlike ever, any, any other that I've ever experienced. Peter claimed to have little knowledge of the history of Alcatraz. He said he let the spirits guide him, and they led him here to an area known as the Citadel. This particular one, I feel there was a loss of life here. And this man was a sergeant. And this is, this is, an, this is an American life that was lost in this particular cell. And uh, I, I feel badly, I, I, I feel beaten. I, I don't feel that I, that I lost life from gunfire. I lost life because of neglect. I was neglected. I, I am responding to, there's a definite sense here that I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. There could not be any crime in the world worth the punishment that I feel this entity endured. Peter had correctly identified the dank dungeon where military prisoners were kept. The specific ghost images he felt were later substantiated by our experts. I'm feeling an American here. I'm feeling an American serviceman right here. Men were kept chained down there, um, sometimes chained through iron rings to the floor, other times, as we understand, chained with iron rings in the ceiling. Something is like going through my stomach. It feels like something metal, and my legs are in chains as well. And I'm feeling that if I stay here much longer, that I'll die. Peter's feelings of death and torment followed us through the night. At daybreak, we replayed Peter's observations for our experts, like ex-guard Al Bloomquist. And after each of Peter's encounters, our experts confirmed the accuracy of his psychic visions. Forced to comply with these orders that I'm, that I'm being given, and I feel like I'm being trapped here in this particular um, um, area. We were told there's trouble on the rock. On May the 2nd, 1946, six inmates with other lesser accomplices decided to blast their way out of the prison. I feel like I'm being thrown into this cell and I'm being thrown into that cell. During that time, they gathered up nine officers, put them inside of cells to be used as hostages. Who are the people in here? Four or five? Are they uh, prisoners? Uh, no, I am a person of authority. I, I feel like I should be on the other side of this of, of, of the bars, but I'm here against my will. I am I am I am here by I am placed here by force, and and at the point of a gun. Who's you know, holding it? Who's shooting? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I feel um, there is there is uh, there is a jo that, that Joseph is involved here. Joseph Kretzer, he was one of the toughest of the bunch. He was really a mean dog. What well. does Joseph have to do with this? Joseph is keeping me captive here. Joseph is placing me here against my will. Where's Joseph? Joe you know, Kretzer took the 45 automatic and started shooting these officers, innocent officers inside the cell. I'm sensing that I, Bill, or William, uh, lost his life here. Only one? Only one. Four or five here? One, there are four one here, but, but others are wounded. But I only feel one loss of life in this particular uh, place. Whose voice are you hearing? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing William. There's a Bill or William. William Miller later died in the hospital in San Francisco. Other officers were very seriously wounded. The name starts with a C. Cecil Corwin had his lower jaw torn away. It's a wonder they weren't all, all killed in the spot. Alarm sounded. Military reinforcements arrived. The inmates fled to a utility corridor in C Block. 46 years later, Peter James led our cameras to the same, now dark, corridor. Peter, you've sensed a lot in there. Yes. Why, why don't you take, we have an infrared lens on the camera, why don't you go in there with the camera and see what you can do on I would, I would, I would like that. I would like that. Uh, Joseph? <coughs> I'm coming through. Mart, 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 Marty, Marty, Mart. Give me a better, give me a better verification of a name. Mart, Marvin? Marvin? Is that Marvin? Marvin Hubbard died in the utility quarter of C Block. Oh, there's a, 
I, I am responding to a sensation here, and I feel like I'm losing consciousness. And what uh, Joseph is telling me is that he's been shot. Joseph Dutch Kretzer died in the utility corridor of C Block. Oh, it's cold. It's freezing back here. There's a cold spot here. And, oh, yes. Hello? There is a third soul here with the letter B. Bernard Paul Coy died in the utility corridor of C Block. Listen, they're moaning. Moaning. The pain is so intense. They're, they're like little boys back here. They're, they're, they're moaning, all, almost asking for the guidance of their parents right now. There are at least a hundred ghosts here, a hundred entities that walk these corridors looking for a way out, looking for that life force that they seem to have lost somewhere. Tragically. I can't really say that I'm a believer myself. But uh, like many people, I guess there are some things that just simply are unexplained. After my night on Alcatraz, it was hard to ignore the images and voices evoked by Peter James. But I still have questions about what we experienced together. Joining me now from Los Angeles is psychic Peter James. Peter, good of you to join us. Thank you, Sam. Nice to have you here. We were together there that evening, and people who see the tape might wonder... Is this guy for real? I don't believe it. It looks like he was making it up. He probably memorized a book. He talked to the guards. He went there half a dozen times. How do you answer that? I had no prior knowledge other than what the general public knows about Alcatraz. We were there together. I tried to be as open as I could through those hours. And as I told you at the time, I didn't hear the voices. I didn't see anything. I didn't sense what you sensed. Does that say something about me or about you, the differences between us? Or does it say something about the entities? They don't choose to speak to you. It says something about all of us, Tim, in that we all spend too much time in trying to disprove that there is another side rather than to simply bridge those gaps of ignorance, as I put it. And yes, some of us are more acutely sensitive as I am. Can you turn it on and off, Peter, or are you seeing and hearing things all the time? I see things all the time. I, I don't know that you can, but I am able to turn it off and on, yes. Peter James, thank you. Thank you for having me. And we will be back with more sightings in just a moment. Coming up next, since 1991, hundreds of Mexican citizens have captured astonishing new evidence of UFOs on videotape. What could it mean? Find out tonight. Now, for the first time on American television, an in-depth look at the largest documented UFO sighting in history. Every week since 1991, thousands of unidentified flying objects have been sighted over Mexico City. And there are people who believe this is just the beginning of an alien invasion predicted more than 3,000 years ago. The sightings began on July 11, 1991. On that day, there was a total eclipse of the sun. One of the best places in the world to view the eclipse was Mexico City. And for the first time, because of the home video revolution, thousands of people pointed their video cameras to the skies. Exactly at the time of the full solar eclipse, a dish-shaped craft appears over the city hovers for over 30 minutes. 17 people on the ground recorded it on home video. And that's never happened before in the history of ufology. When modern scientists forecasted the date of the historic solar eclipse, they weren't alone. Some believe the ancient Mayas also predicted the exact date of the eclipse more than 3,000 years ago. This Maya calendar made another startling revelation. It predicted that on the day of the eclipse, a new age of enlightenment would begin. It's referred to as the prophecy of the sixth sun. The legend of the sixth sun, the new sun, signified by the great eclipse that just occurred, speaks of an opening of knowledge. The sixth sun indicates precisely the moment of its arrival. Strangely, on the day of the eclipse, something did arrive in the skies over Mexico. Hundreds of those home video cameras that were shooting the eclipse got something completely unexpected. UFOs, unidentified flying objects, all videotaped by hundreds of different people. So far, more than 110 home videos have been verified as containing footage of unexplained craft. It may sound difficult to believe in a city with almost 20 million people that practically every afternoon you can see a UFO. 
Jaime Masson is one of the most respected television journalists in Mexico City today, hosting a Mexican version of 60 Minutes. Masson calls himself a former skeptic. During the last year, thousands, and I would say hundreds of thousands of people, have witnessed UFOs. What I feel is important as an investigative reporter is the fact that the evidence presented was never questioned. The credibility of the witnesses was attacked, not the proof that they presented. People from all walks of life videotaped wave after wave of UFOs hovering in the sky. Sightings has obtained the exclusive U.S. rights to these historic tapes. One of the first to come forward with his home video was respected dentist Dr. Marco Antonio Rosas. The people are definitely not nervous or afraid of the appearances of the UFOs. The people actually like the idea and feel that these appearances can bring some benefit to the Earth. After the first tapes were released, more and more people came forward with tapes and photographs. Just outside Mexico City, in the town of Atlisco, the police chief revealed that he had photographs he could not explain. The chief had been trying to take surveillance photographs of a drug smuggler's plane. But when the photos were developed, a startling image was revealed. And I said, what is this? I got upset. I threw the photographer out. I told him this was of no use to my investigation. I showed it to my assistant in the office. I said, look what this guy brought me. He said, hey, that's nice. What would you think if we blew it up? So we called the photographer back in and I asked him to enlarge the picture. From there, all this came out. The truth is, I still don't know what's in that picture. It's a mystery to me. Since the eclipse, the UFO sightings have continued week in and week out. And the acceptance of the phenomena by government officials has made even the most reticent eyewitnesses willing to come forward. Padre Ferrer, a priest at a local Catholic church, has seen and recorded these mysterious UFOs. Christ speaks of uh, his kingdom as not being from this world, that his angels would help him. But these writings are very dangerous and I don't like to use them. But I believe that there is a possibility. I believe there are a lot of possibilities. I came out to take a video of that pine tree against the light. When I came up, I saw the light appear over the mountain over there. It was not an ordinary light. It was um, blue and very intense. I've never been afraid of something like this. On the contrary, what I've been able to observe has been wonderful. Once a philosopher said, if God is outside of the truth, I'll stay with the truth. So I feel there is no contradiction. Unlike the U.S., where UFO controversy most often takes place outside the media mainstream, the Mexico mass sightings are discussed openly on national television. Not everyone agrees the UFOs are extraterrestrial craft. But in Mexico, healthy debate on the true origin of these UFOs is encouraged. So, to rule out the possibility that these UFOs are conventional aircraft or an organized hoax, we had our videotape footage analyzed by David Froning, retired chief scientist at a major aerospace firm. As far as the pictures of in-flight videos, this is about as good as I've seen. They demonstrate a, a field propulsion and technology that's far beyond anything that I'm aware of that we have today. Most scientists look at these things as not that these are phenomena that, that violate uh, known physical laws. It's just that they're phenomena that our, our known laws cannot explain right now. If these craft do defy the laws of physics as we know them, could they be alien spacecraft? Do they pretend a visitation by an enlightened civilization, as some believe? Since our investigation, the sightings have gained international notoriety. Two crews from Japan and a European team are there now. We'll keep you updated on their findings. Coming up next, a special sightings UFO update.
one of our viewers captures startling footage of a UFO from his backyard in Southern California. The unprecedented documentation of sightings in Mexico demonstrates that home video cameras are revolutionizing the study of UFOs. Just recently, one of our viewers captured a UFO on tape and immediately sent it to us. Well, when we first seen it, it was towards that area over here to the west, and it was moving real slowly, hovering and stopping, hovering, stopping. When it got to about this area here, it just zoomed that way real fast, and it stopped and just started blinking on and off. The Rosas family was enjoying an evening swim at their home in Fontana, California, when this UFO appeared to hover over them for about four minutes. Look, it's moving fast now, isn't it? That's four spots, Grandpa. Santos Rosas describes the object as a glowing orange, square-shaped craft. There's no way it could have been a helicopter or an airplane because it didn't have no strobe lights on it, and it didn't make no noise. To me, it was a UFO because there was no jet. It wasn't a helicopter, I know that. Well, we were stunned because we'd never seen anything like this before. And all my, the, my grandsons and my daughter and my wife, they, they couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I still don't believe it. <laughs> Is this light a UFO? The Fontana Police Department couldn't explain it, and a call to military bases operating in the area would not identify this sighting as a military craft. If you videotaped what you believe to be a UFO, or if you've had any type of unexplained paranormal experience you'd like to share, our sightings investigative team wants to know. To report your sighting, please call 1-900-740-SIGHT. 1-900-740-SITE. The call costs 75 cents per minute. Average call lasts two minutes. The number again to report your paranormal experiences, 1-900-740-7483. Must be 18 years or older. This woman has captured bizarre paranormal images on film that defy scientific explanation and a real-life werewolf. The ears began to point and he howled. On the next sighting. Join us next time for new investigations. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Good night. Fox's Friday Night Search Party continues with the series debut of Likely Suspects next and tomorrow on an all-new Cops. A high-tech stakeout leads to one of the most dramatic drug busts in Philadelphia history. Later, see actual footage of a yacht swallowed by a giant wave on Code 3 tomorrow.